going to be reading from John chapter 13, verses 12 to 17. If you've got a church Bible, that's page 900. 900. So John 13, verses 12 to 17. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. This is the word of the Lord. To be here this morning, my name's Darren, I'm the senior pastor here. If we haven't met before, do come and say hi. Uh, I'll be at the back um, grabbing a coffee uh, at the end of our time together this morning. Over the last couple of months, uh, we have been in a series of talks at the 11 called Jesus versus the World. And we've been looking at some of the ways that our Christian faith marks us out as distinctive in this city. Some of the ways that we stand out as followers of Jesus. Uh, we've been looking at sin, at forgiveness, at freedom, at faithfulness. And today we're going to be looking at authority. Authority. And all of this, just to say, is the groundwork which will prepare us early next year to consider from a biblical perspective other cultural issues like gender and sexual relationships, work and identity, mental health, the body, all of that, all of the stuff that you really want to talk about. But before we launch ourselves into those topics completely, we need to do some groundwork or we'll miss the mark. Because the Church of Jesus Christ doesn't just stand out on a few passing superficial cultural issues of our time. The core foundations on which we stand are increasingly different to the foundations of the culture around us. So as we wrap up uh, this series today, we're going to see how we as followers of Jesus have a different understanding of authority, a different understanding of authority than the world around us. Let me pray for us as we start. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are here. You are here with us. And you are ruling and reigning in this place and over the whole world. And Lord Jesus, we ask that you would take charge here this morning. That Lord, as we listen to your words, as we listen to you speaking you would reach down into our hearts and souls and transform us. Lord, nourish our souls. Give us everything that we need from you this morning. In your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 So the authority of Jesus, the authority of Jesus. Jesus says, you call me teacher and Lord in that reading that we just heard. You call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. You're right, says Jesus. You're right to call me Lord as well as teacher, as well as instructor. You're right to give me the title Lord. In Greek, it's kurios. There we go, it's on there. Um, and it means uh, master, it means Lord. It's a word that's loaded with authority. The dictionary definition of authority goes something like this, the power and right to give orders, to make decisions and to enforce obedience. The power and right to give orders, make decisions and enforce obedience. The authority of Jesus was apparent in his teaching. We're told the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. That's Matthew 7. And then in Mark 1, another group of people says a new teaching and with authority. So people around Jesus are seeing his authority. And it wasn't just the people around him who saw his authority. Jesus actually claimed authority for himself frequently. Mark chapter 2, he says, the Son of Man, that's his title for himself, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. 
Jesus prays to his Father, you have given me authority over all flesh, John 17. Jesus tells his disciples before his death and resurrection, he says, I have authority to lay my life down and authority to take it up again. And after the resurrection, before Jesus ascends to heaven, he tells the apostles, the twelve, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. After Jesus has been raised from the dead and ascended into heaven, the early church recognized that his authority hadn't somehow diminished or gone away just because he wasn't physically with them, but quite the opposite. Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, talks about the working of God's great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet. Ephesians chapter 1. The apostle John has a vision of heaven opened up in front of him. And who is on the throne of heaven? Who is at the centre of the power of heaven? The Lamb in the midst of the throne, Revelation 7. Not just on the throne, but in the midst of the throne. You know, not just sat there trying to squeeze out some space next to God the Father, but in the middle of the throne of heaven with absolute and total authority. This is the authority of Jesus. He has the power and the right to make orders, to make decisions, to require obedience. He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. So the historical record, the eyewitnesses to Jesus' life, show us that he constantly claims authority, and people around him constantly see his authority. And it's a claim that his followers accepted, not just in the passage that we started with, but hundreds of times in the New Testament. Jesus is called Lord, Lord, kurios, a word which in the Greek translation of the Old Testament is used mostly to refer to God. Jesus is Lord is a statement about Jesus' divine authority. And becoming a follower of Jesus... Becoming a follower of Jesus means actively embracing the reality of his authority. Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In May last year, uh, King Charles III was crowned. Uh, And some of you might have celebrated and some of you might not have. And that's fine. We're okay with that either way. Um, But, you know, some of the people that were protesting, they had banners that said, not my king. Now, now there are lots of reasons why you might object to constitutional monarchy as a form of government. That's, you know, completely legit. Uh, But those signs made me think, because they implied, really, that it was someone's personal individual decision whether Charles was actually king or not. And the reality is that he is the head of state and he has the authority of a constitutional monarch. Some of us might want to change that, but his authority is a fact. You know, someone might decide not to live as if this is true in a kind of limited way, you know, not show him any honour, not show him any respect, uh, you know, talk badly, maybe campaign to change the system of government. But the reality is that the laws signed by King Charles are legally binding on you and me and will be enforced. And the authority of Jesus is equally a fact It's how the universe has been arranged by God the Father. Some of us may be uncomfortable with the idea of that absolute authority, and we'll come to that a bit more in a moment. But we need to recognise that Jesus claims, and the Bible tells us, and the church has always believed, that Jesus has absolute, total, and complete authority. All authority, he says, all authority. I don't know what that leaves out. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me in everything. He's the boss, no question. Leslie Newbegin, a theologian who's passionate about mission, uh, sharing the good news of Jesus with the world, he puts it like this. He says, the confession I'm making is that Jesus is the supreme authority. 
or using the language of the New Testament that Jesus is Lord. This confession implies a claim regarding the entire public life of mankind and the whole created world. The community that confesses that Jesus is Lord was not and could not be a society offering personal salvation for those who cared to avail themselves of its teaching and practice. It was from the beginning a movement claiming the allegiance of all peoples. That's the church, a movement claiming the allegiance of all peoples. The confession, Jesus is Lord, implies a commitment to make good that confession in relation to the whole life of the world, its philosophy, its culture, its politics, no less than the personal lives of its people. We are, as God's people the people who live under the authority of Jesus and recognise his authority. Our mission is to live under the truth of the authority of Jesus as the Holy Spirit has spoken his word in Scripture. The authority of Jesus expressed in Scripture. In Scripture, We put everything under this. We put everything under the word of Jesus. All of our shared and individual lives, all philosophy, all culture, all politics, all economics, all art and film and creativity, all shopping, all holidays, all online purchases, all family life, all relationships, all friendships, everything. There is nothing excluded. All authority is given to me. We put all of it under the authority of Jesus. We want to live in the truth that Jesus is Lord of all. And you know, one day Jesus will come back. And, and, you know, I didn't vote for you or you're not my king will not be an okay response. <laughs> the authority of Jesus is real and it's universal and it's absolute. He claimed that authority for himself with his words and he showed that authority with his actions showing that he could command with his actions, with his authority, he could command demons, he could command nature, he could command sickness and death and everything. All of that had to yield and give way to his authority. And of course, the authority of Jesus is challenged. The authority of Jesus is challenged. Jesus is Jesus is Lord. He is. But not everyone is happy with this arrangement. There's this time uh, in the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life. Uh, He walks into the temple and he overturns the tables of the money changers. Effectively what he's doing is he's briefly and symbolically and prophetically stopping the animal sacrifices from happening because he is going to bring a much better sacrifice. But he walks into the temple and he takes charge he takes off, it's like it's his temple. He does what he wants to do. He says what he wants to say. He acts as if he is in charge. And uh, this is what happens afterwards. Um, as he, this is Mark chapter 11. As he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? So the people who are asking Jesus this, the people who are challenging his authority to do what he's just done, they were expecting two possible responses from Jesus. One is that Jesus would would link himself with an authority which they already recognised, and so he would get a bit of kudos from association with that. Or secondly, that he would show that he had no link with any authority that they already recognised, and so he'd be discredited and he could be cancelled. But Jesus doesn't actually respond on their terms, and he can't. He can't because his authority was the authority of God himself present in the midst of human history. This was his temple. This was his world. And so he's not going to link himself to another authority. He's not going to say, oh, it's okay, I'm a bit of a Pharisee too. Or, you know, sort of like, I love a bit of worship. It's like, it's okay, you know, we can chill. He's not going to get second-hand authority. He's not going to do that. He's not going to associate himself with another political or religious group. He doesn't need it. And any attempt to recruit Jesus, you know, into your political party 
or your particular social justice campaign, those attempts are misguided. Jesus is his own politics. He's the king of the whole cosmos. He is the bringer of social justice in any and every form, humbling the mighty and lifting up the lowly. Jesus does that. And the scribes, the leaders in the temple, the people asking Jesus, who gave you this authority? They're actually completely unable to recognise the authority of Jesus. They just cannot recognise the authority of Jesus. Why is that? Why is that? Because recognising the authority of Jesus would involve making a commitment to Jesus, which would mean letting go of other commitments that they've already made and don't want to let go of. And Jesus is claiming ultimate authority. So to recognise his authority means making a commitment which, yes, replaces and overturns every other commitment previously made. And this the scribes can't do and they won't do. So making a commitment to Jesus, recognising his ultimate authority, this is what we call faith. This is faith. Pistis in Greek, faithfulness, commitment, loyalty. It means recognising that no other commitment takes priority over this one. My commitment to Jesus, our commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ will always come first. Western culture, that's the public culture of the city that we live in. I know people come from lots of different places, but this is the cultural water that we're all swimming in. Western culture is hugely anxious about authority and hugely anxious about power. And the posture that it takes towards authority is always questioning and, and, and cynicism. And it's important to note that this questioning of every earthly authority is actually a part of our Christian heritage. You know, as Christians, we acknowledge the authority of the Lord Jesus over everything. And so we question all other authorities. We do. Do they align with Jesus? Do they align with the will of God as expressed in Jesus? And in a post-Christian culture where Jesus and God have been removed, what's left? You know, when it comes to authority, all that's left is, first of all, questioning and suspicion and the vague hope that if bad authority is removed, something better will take its place. Good luck with that. And secondly, what's left is myself, me, as the ultimate authority. And that is the radical individualism of our culture, you know, myself. I am the ultimate authority. Human beings can't function without authority, but now in Western culture, all external authority tends to be regarded as oppressive and the only acceptable authority is internal. It's the self, it's me. Romans 13 tells us there is no authority except from God. There is no authority except from God. And Jesus says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So when you remove God as the source of authority, all authority becomes contested and problematic. And, uh, you know, I'm just, if I'm just thrown back on myself as the main authority in my life, this is just too much for a person to carry. You know, to carry the ethical authority for a whole life, to carry the, the economic authority, to carry the moral authority is just too much it's too much for a human being to carry on their own, you know, for that authority to be at the whim of my feelings and preferences and moods. Jesus has an encounter with the authority of his time. He stands in front of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. He's the man with authority over that region of the Roman Empire. And Pilate says to Jesus, don't you know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus doesn't say, you know, he doesn't say, I don't recognise the oppressive imperial regime of the Roman Empire. He doesn't go down that route. He doesn't say, I didn't vote for you. He doesn't say, you're not my Roman governor. He says, because, you know, the reality of it is right there in front of him. He says this. He says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. All authority is from God. 
And if Pilate has authority, it's been given to him. This authority belongs to God, is what Jesus says, and he has given it to you. So how will you use it? What will you do with your authority? Jesus is saying to Pilate, what will you do with your authority? Now that I've told you, it's been given to you. Authority is unavoidable. You're always listening to someone. You're always choosing to hear someone's voice above all the other voices. Even if the only authority you're listening to is yourself all the time. And Pilate, with Jesus in front of him, has to choose which authority which authority to listen to. And here's the thing. People in, in the culture that we live in, in the city that we live in, in this great city, think that submitting to any external authority is giving in to oppression and that challenging authority is the bold and the brave thing to do. Now, what do we do with that as followers of Jesus? Well, first of all, I want to say yes. We want to question every authority. Because we know that Jesus is Lord and everything is under his feet. We are the ultimate authority challengers. And as followers of Jesus, we submit to his authority. And that submission, you know, ordering our whole life, our worldview, our decisions, everything we have, everything we are, ordering that under Jesus is not easy, not even slightly In fact, it needs a miracle from the Holy Spirit. But submission, submission is a Christian virtue. Submission is a Christian virtue. Jesus submits to his Father. Not my will, but yours. Even Jesus submits. We submit to the authority of Jesus. And we submit to each other. And this, Jesus tells us, is the path that leads to life, not oppression. And this looks crazy in the eyes of the world. I know, because in the eyes of our city, authority is all about me. I'm the main authority in my life. Authority is about my freedom to exercise my power and to make my demands. But Jesus shows us something much more nuanced about authority, much more multi-layered about how authority is held by God. Jesus teaches his disciples, and he shows them with his actions that his authority is, bizarrely, the authority of a servant, the authority of a slave. In that passage we started with, Jesus has just washed the feet of his disciples and he says this, he says, you call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Jesus is showing his disciples not just an example of service, you know, he's showing them how he brings two things together which seem to be mutually exclusive. He brings together his very real authority. You call me Lord and you're right. And secondly, the life of a servant. You know, in Greek the word is doulos, it means a household slave, someone who was expected to work in Roman culture in return for their keep. And he brings those two things together. It's a lesson that he repeats several times for his followers. Matthew chapter 20, you know, he says, that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you, not wrong to want to be great, please want to be great. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came. Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus comes using his authority to serve. He comes using his authority to serve, to do stuff for other people. He's a son in his father's household and there's work to do. So Jesus does it. And when we give our allegiance, when we have faith, when we give our allegiance to King Jesus, we are sons and daughters in God's household. 
with all of the status and privileges and glory that that entails. And, and, there's work to do. We probably think that that deep down, you know, authority and service just don't go together. But Jesus is clear. If you want to be great, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to be great, this is how you do it. You serve. You do the same work that God does taking responsibility for the sins of the world even though they're nothing to do with you taking responsibility for other people's rubbish taking off your shirt and washing feet if that's what's needed to build up the family of God for Jesus and for us the evidence of his authority is exactly his willingness to serve humanity Paul writing to uh, Christians in Philippi Uh, A lot of people think that he's quoting an early Christian hymn or worship song. He's writing to Christians in the church in Philippi and he says this, Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, literally he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, I don't want you to miss that, therefore, it's like because of all this, because he emptied himself, because he humbled himself, because he submitted obediently, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Would the band like to come up? This is the authority of Jesus. It's an authority which shows itself in the life of a servant serving the whole world. And this is the authority he wants to invite us, his followers, his brothers and sisters, his family. He wants to invite us to share that authority. You know, all of the authority that Jesus exercises over sin, his authority over sickness, his authority over evil spiritual forces, his authority over culture and politics and economics and business, he wants to share that with us. There is no area of his authority that Jesus will not share with those who are faithful to him and committed to him. Second Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we keep going, we will share his authority with him. Revelation chapter 2, to the one who conquers, I will give authority over the nations over the nations we don't want to just take on our culture's suspicions around authority we don't want to let other voices in to challenge the authority of Jesus we want to be a people marked by a radical approach to authority living under the authority of Jesus 100% under the authority of Jesus and 100% expressing that authority like he does in the service of each other and the service of the world. You know, human beings need authority to flourish, and the authority of me is not enough. And Jesus wants to rescue us from the world that's just got ourselves in the middle of it. He wants to help us to step into a world where he is king. The authority of Jesus, it's real, it's absolute, it's cosmic, It's wide and it's generous. And his rule is good and life-giving. His rule leads to peace and forgiveness and healing and blessing. And he wants to invite all of us here to step more deeply into that today. Would you like to stand with me?